Good morning, everyone. Again, welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're going to be continuing today our Bible study in the book of Galatians. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. I'm just going to do a little review, Galatians chapter 1, verse 17. And before we get into the Word this morning, let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless and thank you for this day. We thank you. This is the day that you've made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it, Lord God. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to look into your word. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you want to reveal to each part today as we continue to study this book and the topic of your amazing grace. So we ask for this, that you just lead and guide each one of us today as we spend this time with you and in your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we're picking it up in verse 17, and I'll read that verse again. We, we did cover this last week. Uh, verse 17 says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So, of course, we know that Paul went to Arabia, and it says he returned again to Damascus. That word again indicates that Paul had left from Damascus after his conversion on the road to Damascus, uh, and then he went into Arabia, and he returned there after his time alone that he had spent there with God. Now, we read about this event in the, the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, it describes in that chapter Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, uh, the visit that he had with Ananias, who came and prayed with him, that his eyes might be opened and that he might be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's pick it up. This is all brand new information now in verses 18 through 20. It says, now, after, sorry, pardon me, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which are right to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Now that expression, many days, refers to the period of three years which Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18. And it was during this time that Paul made his journey into Arabia where he received his New Testament revelation from God. Now, how long that revelation lasted, we don't know for sure, but we do know from Paul's other writings that this was time that was well spent. Afterwards, Paul returned to Damascus, where he began to preach and teach in the Jewish synagogue. His message so stirred up the Jews, they got so riled up that he literally had to flee for his very life. Now, when he gets to Jerusalem, he spent two weeks with Peter. Now, I think it would be an awesome, I would love to be a, a fly on the wall in that conversation, where Paul uh, met up with Peter and began to share with Peter all that the Lord had revealed to him. I'm, I'm sure it was good for Peter because no one needed a good, stable foundation more than Simon Peter. I mean, we know he benefited from that association with Paul because later on in his own epistles that he wrote, uh, he made reference to Paul's writings, noting that they were far advanced and contained many things hard to understand but needful for the body of Christ. That's uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Now you notice in verse 20 that he says, I lie not. Now you say, well, why, why did he have to say that? The reason Paul says this is because the, the legalistic Judaizers have come into Galatia behind him to stir up the people by casting doubts on the things that Paul has been saying, and particularly his qualifications as an apostle. So Paul is defending his apostleship against these men whose purpose is to lead the uninformed and impressionable Galatians back into the bondage of the law. Now, it's interesting because if you, if you were ever to go into the ministry and anybody in ministry Know that it's likely, most likely, that your greatest opposition that you're going to face is going to be from established religion. Like Paul, you may find yourself the object of ridicule and scorn. And, and if that happens, don't be surprised. Don't be overcome by it. Above all, don't give in to anger and do not give in to retaliation. Be firm in your beliefs, but operate in love towards those who hear you gladly and those who oppose you and your message. Now, Paul exercised his authority as an apostle, but he always did it in a spirit of love. And that's very important for us as well. We need to be doing the same thing. For how can we ever convince the world and the church 
of God's love for them if we don't demonstrate that love ourselves. So let's, uh, let's read now verses 21 through 24. We're getting towards the end of chapter 1, and I'm sure somebody's saying, well, praise the Lord, it's taken a while for us to get there. But let's pick it up in verse 21. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, but sorry, pardon me, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Now it says, Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So after staying in Antioch for some period of time, Paul made his way to this region of, of Syria and Sicily, but had never been seen by the churches of Judea, meaning the big established churches like the one that would be obviously established in Jerusalem. That seems strange to us today. Our way of thinking, if Paul had wanted to be recognized anywhere, it would have probably been in the first church, the church in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, a lot of young preachers today, they want to be known by the powers that be, to become associated with and recognized by the big names in important places. Yet here is Paul, who was is, who is personally ordained and commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and he goes about launching his ministry in an out-of-the-way out place like Damascus, not even bothering to try to make himself known outside that small area of influence. And that's the way it should be done. I mean, God may call you to some great ministry someday, but if he does, more than likely, he's going to start you out in the ministry in a small way. I can relate to that because, you know, when I first started working at the church, I was 19 years old, and I started as the janitor. I was cleaning toilets. I was doing all that kind of stuff. And so I, you know, yeah, there was a call in my life, but I didn't immediately start going out and starting to preach. There was things that I had to do to establish myself. And then I was teaching Sunday school classes and youth classes and being faithful where, where God wanted me to be, okay? So, you know, and you may find yourself in that situation, but don't despise that, okay? It, it's all part of God's plan. It's, in fact, if I could put it this way, it's all part of God's management trainee program, if I could put it that way. See, before he gives you a great ministry, he will give you a small one. You've got to start out in, a, in that small area and prove yourself in those small things. Prove yourself in the small things, then you will be prepared for what God has in store and the larger things that will come. See, in our Father's business, there's always a proving time before there's promotion. And we have very, uh, actually quite a few biblical examples of that. David, he tended sheep for years before he ever had gone out and slew Goliath. And you know what he did after he'd slain the giant? He went right back to tending sheep. I mean, you would have thought he would have been a, an a appointed governor of, of the land, or at least captain of the armies of Israel. But all that and more would come later. As of course, we know, you know, obviously, you know, if you read the Bible, you know that David eventually becomes the king over the nation. But it wasn't his time yet. David wasn't elevated right away because he wasn't ready for it. He wasn't through growing yet. Uh, the same is true of the prophet Elijah. I mean, we know nothing of Elijah's younger days. He just seemed to pop up on the scene one time when he was about 30 years of age. Uh, and apparently he'd spent those first 30 years of his life proving himself for the task that lay ahead of him. As so often is the case, it took Elijah years of preparation and effort to become an overnight success, if I could put it that way. Same is true of Joseph. Joseph proved himself again and again in his father's household, in the household of Potiphar, in the prison to which he'd been uh, wrongly sentenced. Whatever his circumstances, Joseph worked to show himself worthy of trust and responsibility. And he got them both. So much so that one day, you know the story, he was promoted to second in the land under Pharaoh himself. Another overnight success. I mean, even think about our Lord Jesus Christ. God's own son spent the first 30, uh, first 30 of his 33 years of earthly life basically in obscurity. Known only to a handful of people. But he was known to God, and that was the important thing. He was known to God. And that's all that mattered, because in the fullness of time, when the time was right, he was revealed for who he was. Now think about that for a moment. For the, for the first 30 years of his life, nobody had ever heard of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, how, now, today, how many millions of people down to the ages have heard of him? 
Think about it. In three short years, Jesus went from the obscurity of a Galilean carpenter to become the very center of all human history. And, I mean, it can go that way for us as well. Not that we're comparing ourselves completely to Jesus here, okay? But if you're faithful, you will be revealed for who you are and what you are if you will stand behind the Word of God. Don't exalt yourself. I'll say that again. Do not exalt yourself. Exalt the Word. Exalt the Word. Exalt her wisdom, and she shall promote you. She shall bring you honor when you embrace her. That's Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 8. So if you want to be promoted, you've got to be worthy of promotion. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pick it up. Actually, now we finished with, with chapter 1. Let's get into chapter 2 now. And we're going to read the first 10 verses, and then we're going to break these verses down. So, uh, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me, God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. All right, now, we have said, probably right from the beginning of teaching this book, that the book of Galatians has a dual theme. Number one, salvation by the grace of God versus salvation by works. Number two, spirituality by grace versus spirituality by works. Now, both of these two themes will be brought up in the second chapter of, of, of Galatians here. And the first of these two is illustrated by this incident in Jerusalem, which Paul refers, uh, sorry, pardon me, relates to the churches in Galatia. Now you pick it up in verse the first part of verse 1. It says, in 14 years after, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem. And this verse, Paul reveals that this was his second trip to Jerusalem after his conversion. And the first, we know because we've just looked at it, the first was three years after that event when he went to see Peter and spent two weeks with him, during which time he also saw James, the brother of Jesus, but none of the other apostles. Now this second trip comes 14 years after the first. And in this passage, Paul reveals to us the reason for this second journey. It goes on in, in verse 1, it says, With Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now this statement right there is significant because Titus, Titus is actually the key person in this story, which we also find in the 15th chapter of Acts, in which Paul and Barnabas defend their ministry before the church in Jerusalem. And it says, and I went up, verse, uh, verse 2, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the church in Jerusalem, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now here we're beginning to get a little bit of light uh, a little bit of understanding of Paul's reason for going back to Jerusalem. He tells us he went there purposefully to explain to them the gospel message that he had been preaching to the Gentiles. Now why, after all these years, did he suddenly decide that he needed to go to Jerusalem to explain and defend his ministry? Well, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. The answer has to do with what Paul perceived as a growing menace to the gospel of grace which he is defending to the Galatians in this chapter. See, with the passage of time, the church in Jerusalem had become, had become uh, very legalistic. It had originally come into being, think about it, 
The church in Jerusalem had originally come into being as a result of the thousands who came to the Lord through the preaching of the disciples on and after the day of Pentecost. So Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, Jerusalem pardon me, had become the center of, of Christian missionary activity as evangelists were sent out all directions from that church to carry out the good news. But as the site of the Jewish temple and the center of Hebrew culture, pardon me, Jerusalem was also a hotbed of Judaism, which had infiltrated the church there through the many years. And just as this situation came to a head, Paul received word by revelation of the Lord to make a journey back to the Jerusalem church. And that timing of that revelation, uh, pardon me, that revelation, pardon me, was no accident. See, for over 14 years, Paul had never gone to the Jerusalem church to tell them face to face of his ministry and his message. What the believers in Jerusalem knew of him and his ministry had come back to them as hearsay. Only James and Peter had ever talked to, to, to Peter or talked to Paul, pardon me, firsthand. We know that from Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Now, here he is about to arrive on the scene at a crucial moment, bringing with him one of his Gentile converts, an action which was bound to bring matters to a head. Okay? As Paul no, do, no doubt knew full well that this was going to possibly cause an issue. And as a result of this confrontation, Judaism was set back for a time in the capital city, though it later resurfaced as it did from time to time, and as legalism has always done, Throughout the centuries. Now notice, again, we're going to refer back to this, him bringing Titus with him. He says, he, he took, he, I took Titus with me also. Now, I believe that it was at that time of his sojourn in Arabia that the Lord revealed to Paul his marvelous plan of salvation, which he wrote about from then on until the end of his life on the earth. Now, if that's true, then Paul's remarks here to the Galatians undermine his motive for taking Barnabas and especially Titus with him for that return trip to Jerusalem to share his revelation with the church there. See, Titus, as a Gentile convert to Christ, being uncircumcised, Titus thusly becomes a living example, as well as a test case, if I could put it that way, of the doctrine of salvation by grace rather than by keeping the Jewish law. So Titus' presence with Paul was not at all incidental. It was the real crux of his visit to that Jerusalem church. See, if Titus was accepted by the brothers in Jerusalem, it would stand as irrefutable evidence of the validity of Paul's apostleship and of his message of salvation by grace alone. Now, verse 2 again. It says, let's read verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Okay, so we notice that he, that first part of that verse there, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Paul's visit to Jerusalem was not mere happenstance. Okay, it was divinely planned, it was divinely timed. At just the right moment, the Lord spoke to Paul and told him what to do to bring that message of grace home, back to the, actually to the home church. Uh, it goes on in the second part of that verse, but privately to them which were of reputation. Now them which were of reputation were Peter, James, and John, the leaders in the Jerusalem church. Paul was very diplomatic, but he was also very wise. Before he took his message... Before the entire church body, he arranged a private meeting with the church leaders to communicate to them what he'd been preaching to the Gentiles and the result of that message. The latter part of verse, verse 2, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. By this ex expression, Paul is simply saying, I was aware, I was completely, totally aware that if I did not handle this situation very carefully, I could do, just, just destroy everything that I was doing, everything that I had already done up to that time. So this is it was a very delicate situation that he was dealing here. And that's a good lesson for us, especially those of us that are in ministry. It's highly important how we handle ourselves when dealing with others, not only in the church, but without the church as well. 
We might have the right message, the right words from God, but if we don't present them in the right manner, we could destroy our ministry. You know, and, you know, that there's, we've got to be careful we don't get off into boasting, too. Because some can say, well, you know, hey, we're a church that preaches the uncompromised word of God. And up front, that sounds fine, okay? But you've got to be careful that there's an attitude of spiritual pride that does not enter in there, okay? Pride... Okay, and pride is insidious. It can creep in and it will destroy our lives. It will destroy anything and everything that we've tried to, to build or have built, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of humility that's involved. Anybody involved in ministry in any period of time, you know there's humility. You also need tact. You need diplomacy. You need discretion. You need wisdom, okay? You need all of those things when presenting the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've, we've always got to be every, uh, on our guard. Okay? Against the dogmatism which so easily can slip into and twist our message of love and grace and forgiveness. Because it can so, so easily get twisted into a message of ridicule and judgment of those who do not see the, the same things the way we see them. And although we cherish the right to preach the truth as we believe God has revealed it to us, we must never, ever uh, misuse that privilege by mistaking it as a license to impose our beliefs and convictions on others. We do well to remember always that none of us has an exclusive franchise on the truth. Okay, going on in verse 3. Chapter 2 and verse 3. And it says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Okay, so Paul's meeting with the three leaders of the church, it was a success. Okay, by receiving his Gentile, by receiving that his Gentile convert without requiring him to submit to the demands of Jewish circumcision. They were, in essence, endorsing Paul's message and ministry. And this point is of vital importance, which is why Paul pointed it out to the believers in Galatia, themselves Gentiles, who therefore could identify with Titus. Okay, let's look at verse 4. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. The, the NIV says the matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Okay, so Paul's victory, that tells me right there in that verse that Paul's victory was not uh, to be won easily. Somehow, somehow some false brethren, false brethren here being legalistic Judaizers, Heard of Paul, they heard of Paul's meeting with the church leaders and came in to challenge him before the elders. Paul used Titus to convince all that were present that salvation and spirituality were by faith alone. Since they could not beat Paul in conference face to face, Paul's opponents began to follow his ministry and to undermine him privately after he had left the city. So he was not there to defend himself or the message that he was preaching. And this is but exactly what had been going on in Galatia. Well, what was their ultimate purpose of doing this? Okay? To make us slaves. It says it right there. To make us slaves. That's the way legalism works. It always tries to bring into bondage those who have been set free by the gospel. Uh, we go down to verse 5. Verse 5. Let me just find it here. Ah. Uh, where is verse 5? To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay, the, the New American Standard Bible clarifies Paul meaning in this verse, which it translates this way. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Okay, so Paul, he was not fooled by these people for one moment. Okay, and he was not intimidated by them. He stood his ground against them and their attempts to bring him and his followers into subjection to legalism. Paul did this openly before all the church leaders of Jerusalem. Uh, let's see here now. Uh, verse 6. We're going to read verse 6 down to verse 10. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised had been committed to me, 
as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do. All right, so. Now, verses 6 through 10, you might not completely get what was being uh, expressed there. So we're gonna, I'm going to read those verses to you again, but I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them out of the, uh, the New English Bible. Okay, so this is the translation of those, those same verses. But as for the men of high reputation, not that their importance matters to me, God does not recognize uh, these personal distinctions, these men of repute, I say did not prolong the cons consultation or give me no further instructions, but on the contrary, acknowledge that I had been entrusted with the gospel for Gentiles as surely as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for Jews. For God, whose action made Peter an apostle to the Jews, also made me an apostle to the Gentiles. Recognizing then the favor thus bestowed upon me, those reputed pillars of our society, James, Cephas, and John, accepted Barnabas and myself as partners, and shook hands upon it, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles while they went to the Jews. All they asked was that we should keep their poor in mind, which was the very thing I made, or had made, or have made, my business to do. Okay, so in closing this morning, uh, basically to, to give the breakdown of those last few verses, Paul was fully recognized and accepted as an apostle by the church in Jerusalem. Not only was he recognized as an apostle by the church in Jerusalem, they also endorsed his message of salvation by grace. And that's, that's, that's a fantastic thing. They made no attempt to impose any restrictions whatsoever on Paul or on his ministry, or upon his Gentile convert, of course, who was Titus, though it was fully known that Titus was an uncircumcised Greek. Thus, Paul relates this Jerusalem incident to the believers in Galatia to impress upon them his full and complete vindication before the church fathers in Jerusalem, and to emphasize to these people the completeness of their salvation by grace through simple faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary. The, the, the Jerusalem incident, which basically these 10 verses in chapter 2 are referred to, illustrates Paul's theme of salvation by grace. And the remaining half of this chapter, chapter 2, uh, his second theme, spirituality by grace, will be brought out, and that is what we will examine when we come together next week. Praise God. I trust that you learned something from this. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day. Amen.